A bad mess, this, said Professor Forney to Sergeant Reynolds as they viewed the bloody scene. Yeah, I wish these guys wouldn't be quite so thorough when they bump themselves off, replied Reynolds as he set grimly to work. A man with his throat cut, the head almost severed, sat slumped over a blood-spattered desk. What a horrible sight. His blood-stained coat flung across the room, the razor, the shirt, the tie, his hands, covered with blood, made a ghastly and awesome picture framed by the flickering light of a dying candle. After turning on the lights, Forney bent down to take a closer look at the man. His face seems vaguely familiar, Sergeant, but I can't recall at the moment where I've seen him. How long has he been dead, Doctor? About two hours, replied the police surgeon. At this moment, the telephone rang. The caller, upon hearing Forney's voice, immediately disconnected. Odd, murmured the professor as he hung up the receiver. I remember now where I saw this man. His name is Thompson. As he glanced around, he observed that the alarm clock on the dresser had stopped just two hours and fifteen minutes before. The telephone rang again, and Forney motioned Reynolds to answer. Hello, he said. Mr. Thompson stepped out for a few minutes. Leave your number. I'll have him call you. The man at the other end inquired who was speaking, and, when Reynolds replied, a friend, he hung up. Better trace that call, Sergeant. This is murder, said Forney. What? exclaimed Reynolds. Still looks like suicide to me. Let us recap. In this short mystery, we have a man whose throat has been slit and lays face down on his desk, covered with blood. The two characters we have here, Professor Forney and Sergeant Reynolds, are attempting to solve the case. Sergeant Reynolds came to the conclusion that it was suicide, while Professor Forney believed it to be murder. After reviewing this mystery, I have concluded that Professor Forney was right. I will explain by focusing on details such as the razor, candle, clock, and phone calls. There is a razor covered in blood, which would imply that Mr. Thompson used it to kill himself. But if we go back a bit, it says, A man with his throat cut, the head almost severed, sat slumped over a blood-spattered desk. It describes Mr. Thompson's head was almost severed. I think it would be doubtful to think that a razor would be sharp or dense enough to cut bone, let alone having the time to do so before your eventual death. Mr. Thompson's throat had to have been cut by someone else, and with a more dangerous weapon. At the scene of the crime, there was a dying candle that illuminated the victim. Though an interesting thing to point out is that lights were turned on in his room by Forney and Reynolds. Why would have Mr. Thompson needed a candle if lights could be turned on in his room? This leads me to believe that there was a power outage, and the fact that the candle was dying implies that it has been burning for an extended period of time. We get an estimation from the police surgeon, saying that Mr. Thompson has been dead for about two hours. This brings us to the clock. The clock sits on top of Mr. Thompson's dresser, and it appears to have stopped. An important thing to note is the time displayed on the clock, showing that it had stopped just two hours and 15 minutes before. If we choose to use the police surgeon's estimate, the clock stopped around 15 minutes before Mr. Thompson's death, which is when I believe the power went out. I suspect that the power outage was caused by the murderer to give them an advantage over their victim. Eventually, there are two phone calls. The person who called hung up quickly the first time when they heard the professor's voice. Then they called a second time, and the phone was picked up by the sergeant. I believe that the person who called was involved with the crime and was calling to get some kind of confirmation. Like, for example, Mr. Thompson not picking up the phone would imply that the job was done. As directly contacting the murderer would be too risky, considering that the crime was committed two hours ago. During the second phone call, the caller inquired who was speaking, and, when Reynolds replied a friend, he hung up. The caller obviously knew Mr. Thompson as well as Professor Fortney, whom the caller hung up on. The caller may not have committed the crime, but likely orchestrated it. Therefore, I conclude that Professor Fortney was correct in his answer. The murder was set up to look like Mr. Thompson committed suicide, with the murder overlooking some important details such as the razor, the candle, and the clock. And it was all orchestrated by the person who was calling Mr. Thompson's telephone.